Oh, hey, I'm Coco, and welcome to our talk show, Single and Too Tired to Mingle. We'll be talking about relationships with ourselves, our exes, our kids, and other important beings. So stay tuned. Hi, Catherine, how are you doing? I am great. <laughs> welcome back to Tuesday Talks. Lovely to see you. Yes. Um, but why are you here again? <laughs> I am here to interview the woman behind all the interviews. <laughs> to prove you like you have Oh, us. I see. I think I like the other way better, actually. <laughs> yeah. So really, um, I'm so happy that you're back. Your video is doing so, so well. So it's clearly found um, viewers that are so interested in what you have to say. Um, so I'm looking forward, maybe, I don't know yet. <laughs> Um, let's say I'm looking forward to you interviewing me today. <laughs> yeah, I think Some we all insights. are. I think for the people watching mm -hmm. your show, we're always curious about you as well. Okay. Right? What's what sort of prompted your interest in all of this? Mm -hmm. And you've written a book. Yes. So, which I have read cover to cover. <laughs> and really enjoyed it. Okay. So, one thing I will say about the book is not only is it entertaining, mm -hmm. but it's very informative. And mm -hmm. I think that's why I wanted to do this interview with you today because okay. I think that regarding the book, the way you have it sort of set out is like you talk about yourself and your stories, yeah. so it's really engaging, but yet you give a lot of prompts and questions to the audience reading the book. You have questions at the end, you have lots of research, so yeah. it's like we're going on our own journey as we're yeah. reading yours. Okay, so great. it's really, really helpful. <laughs> so these are some of the things that I wanted to cover. Is something, some things about you, mm -hmm. as well as okay. give some help for the viewers to be able to reflect on their own life. Yeah, I think that's what my researcher kind of kicked in. I wanted yeah. to do, not just like I went through X, Y, and Z, I wanted to see what literature has to say about yeah. that as well, because I think everyone goes through a different experience in life, mm -hmm. and it's just good to maybe see what people do have as experience, but also what does research say? Because obviously, yeah. psychologists and other people mm -hmm. have their view as well, so it's just nice to kind of see where you are and what you maybe need to improve. Yeah, absolutely. So, one of the things that you came up with, the concept of the three pillars. Mm -hmm. So, I kind of wanted to discuss that, and then organize our conversation around the three pillars. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> so what are the three pillars? So, um, at some point in my life, I found myself unhappy, mm -hmm. and which was quite unusual because as a character, I'm quite chirpy and outgoing, and I've always taken life from kind of the easier side. Mm -hmm. um, and then one day looking through photographs, I realized that on every single photograph, I just look a bit miserable and just really mm -hmm. not happy and I and that really threw me so I thought I wonder where this is coming from and at the same time I wasn't really feeling myself kind of a hundred percent I have to say at this time I also had like two small children so I guess life changes anyway and I had actually a really high growing company as well so my own company so and we were building a house at the same time so there were a lot of things that were happening at the same time however nothing was really wrong so there should be no reason why I'm looking unhappy and so from realizing that, I actually went on a two-year internal journey just to see why I'm not where I used to be. Mm -hmm. um, and so through this two-year process of analyzing what's making me happy, what's making me unhappy, I put together three pillars. And the three pillars are things that are most important to me and what influences my mood. Mm -hmm. And so I came up with the fact that I need to make sure that my children are okay or are they okay? Um, that I'm doing what I like to do um, work-wise because mm -hmm. that's really important to me. I like to work, so I like to be happy with what I'm doing. And then there's myself slash my partner. So these are the three things that are actually mm -hmm. key to my life and not a lot of things outside of these three influence mm -hmm. my life to any significant manner. Right, so you had a reflective moment and came up with yeah. this concept <laughs> yeah. where it's very easy for you to check in with these three aspects of your life. Exactly, and ever since then, if I'm finding myself not happy, I do actually check these three pillars yeah. and just see what needs to be yes. modified or rectified. And it's actually served me so, so well. So let's maybe go through those three pillars. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> so the three pillars are children, career, and relationships. Correct. Let's start off with the easiest one, the career. Yes. Oh, the career. I thought you were going to say children. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot complicated, a lot oh, okay. more complicated As to I raise say, kids I, I, than oh, really? <laughs> career. <laughs> As I said, I tried to take, uh, take things from the light side of life. 
So with my career? Yeah. So one of the things that immediately stood out mm -hmm. is for as, as happy, go lucky and warm and easy as you are, you're quite a brainiac. <laughs> so you have a PhD a a geek. <laughs> in what is it? Biochemistry and molecular biology. Yeah, that is true. And the funny thing is that when I was in my second year of university, which was I, had, I have a farming degree from my degree, okay. um, which wasn't that hard. Um, and we had biochemistry at the second year and I'm sitting there in my lectures. I clearly remember that to this day. And I'm thinking, who the hell goes to study biochemistry and then lectures? <laughs> and lo and behold, four years later, it was me, right? Um, yeah, it's, uh, it was quite interesting. It came about when I was going with, I, had, I was in a long-term relationship and we were both ending our universities at the time. Mm -hmm. And for him, it was very clear what he was going to study as mm -hmm. his post-grad. For me, it was like, I, I actually enjoy farming, but I wouldn't have learned anything new. It was a very small university and the same professors, the same subject. And I'm like, there's no point that I'm doing that. Plus, jobs after that are going to be quite difficult and scarce to find. So then I thought, oh, I'll just study what you're studying. So my boyfriend, so we can these be classmates. <laughs> I'm like, actually, what you're studying, I cannot study. It doesn't interest me enough. And then on the last page of this booklet that they had of natural sciences, I found biochemistry and molecular wow. biology. And I thought, oh, this is actually so interesting. And so okay. I thought, let me do it. Wow. <laughs> and that's how I go through life. <laughs> so something that's as difficult as a PhD in that chosen subject, yeah. one would think then you end up dedicating your life yeah. to working in a lab. Right, that is true. using this PhD, but it seems like you use utilize the PhD very little. It's like you learned, you got your degree, and then you're off to <laughs> other interests. That like one thing that really stood out is the variation of your career choices, mm. right? And I find that really intriguing because usually a person's mind can like work one way. Yeah. But it seems like no, for you, <laughs> you can redirect yourself yeah. any which way and make it work. Yeah. I seem to have a lot of bizarre talents. <laughs> so with a PhD, I actually really enjoyed it, I have to say. Mm -hmm. So I was studying eating disorders. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, how I came to study that was I had a choice of either cancer or eating disorders because that's what the lab was about. And I thought, I don't want to do cancer. You never know when that happens. And I don't want to be studying that because then for any spot or anything I have, I'm thinking, okay, right. that's it. Right. So eating disorders, I, know, I knew that I would never have anorexia or bulimia. So I thought, let me study that. <laughs> this is a safe topic. <laughs> this is a safe topic. <laughs> I like Not food way free. too much that I would ever go down the anorexic route. Yeah, yeah. Let me study that. Um, and I have to say, it was really, really interesting. It was mm -hmm. eye-opening on so many levels. I got to work with a lot of psychiatrists because they had the um, kind of diagnostic part. We mm -hmm. had the genetic part. Um, and I think that a lot of people say, oh, didn't you waste your PhD? But like even writing this book, nothing is wasted ever in life. Like I learned how to be yeah. a researcher and yeah. look at things in a different way. Right. Yeah. So when I was writing a book, it actually started out as a pure autobiography. And then I thought, actually, I don't know, when we're talking about parenting, for example, I thought, let me actually look this up. Like, what are the kind of, um, you know, ways to parent a child? What are the outcomes? And I learned a lot about myself in the mm. way that I was parented in the process. So despite the fact, yeah, I don't want to spend my life in the lab, literally. It's just too slow moving. I like I like business. I like stuff that's or doing these interviews. Mm. It's like fast paced. It's people oriented. Um, knowledge is quick things are moving along so i think character wise yeah um i'm much more suited to the outside world out of the lab but i found the studies super interesting and um i wouldn't have done it any differently but it was so difficult that year one when i was sitting there i thought i don't even understand what they're saying <laughs> when i was looking at my notes yeah. going back i'm like what was i even writing yeah <laughs> this, this is a different language <laughs> this yeah. is like uh, yeah. But I think also in life, when you go past through something like that and you overcome it and you're actually, mm -hmm. and you've done it well, because actually I enrolled in a master's, but then I had all my conditions met quite quickly. So I went to a direct PhD. Um, when you go through something that difficult, when you're staring at the lecturer and thinking, what are you even saying? It just makes you realize in life that even if something is difficult, it's not, it's just difficult. And I tell my kids now, once at uni, I'm like, don't worry about it. It's just hard. Mm. And you just move on from there and you make the effort and then it gets better. So what I think I find really interesting when I sort of look at the variation of the career choices that yeah. you've had and how easily you've been able to shift gears mm. is that something that sort of as a psychologist when I'm working with people, something that comes across and there's a whole theory around this mm -hmm. is that when we invest a lot of energy and time into something right. and we, it's very, very difficult 
then it's very hard to like let go even if afterwards it's no longer right, serving us okay. or we're done with it we're like but i put so much time and energy into okay. this and that was really interesting reading the book because it was like you sort of seem to be present to the moment it was like this isn't serving me anymore yeah correct. so i'm gonna let go of this and go and this is a new opportunity i'm gonna let go of this so did they there wasn't any like attachment to your past and the effort you're ready to let it go and move on to something new and start from base Scratch, and, yeah. and and build up again yeah, I think as I go, as I get old, I'm thinking, why am I always starting things from scratch? <laughs> so I think that I'm very acute to the fact that I don't want to be unhappy in life. Mm -hmm. There's literally, I refuse to be unhappy. End of story. Right. And why should I be? And so when something is not interesting to me anymore, or if I've, if it's just served its purpose, and I don't want to do it anymore, mm -hmm. and there's something else that's now happened, and it's, it's interesting to me, and I feel like I can be good at it, then I do that. Um, is it difficult for you to let go? No, not at all. Not at all. Because I, you're committed to your happiness and moving forward. Yeah, I don't have an attachment issue and I refuse to... Okay, I'll give you an example. Okay. When we were in high school, mm -hmm. uh, my bedroom had a balcony and we, I would have my girlfriends come over, we'd sit on the balcony, we would smoke a little bit, um, you know, drink a little mm -hmm. bit and whatever. And then one, t one day I found myself in my, in my room. This is, so what was I, maybe 16? And I was like, oh my God, I really feel like having a cigarette. None of my family smokes, right? But we just did. Um, and I'm like, oh my God, let me find some cigarettes because I would have like a stash hidden with my friends, right? So I'm like looking around my room, where are these cigarettes? Where, where, where have we hidden them? And then I'm like, what am I doing? I'm literally looking for cigarettes. Like, are you crazy? This is so unhealthy and I refuse to be addicted to anything. I don't want to have my mm. life overruled by something else. And at that moment, that was it. I didn't, I haven't smoked since. Like, okay. so I refuse to be like a victim of something that is not good for me and it's no longer serving me. Like okay. why? I, just, I don't understand kind of that concept. Mm. Um, but so you don't have issues letting go. I don't, and no. moving forward. No, I don't. And you know, it's interesting too because like when you're reading your book, it's like in hindsight you can see how things fit into one another. Mm. For instance, with the PhD, it was one of the reasons you ended up in London. Yeah, correct. <laughs> right? And then met Matthew, who correct, you ended yeah. up having kids with. So Yeah, so that was the moment that my life literally went a different yeah. trajectory altogether. Maybe as a result, let's move into relationships since Matthew's come up. <laughs> yeah, so I think I was kind of... So my previous relationship was amazing. And yes. that's kind of my benchmark, unfortunately, for other relationships. I'm saying fortunately because it was that good. Mm -hmm. um, it was very easy. Um, I was loved. I was in love. And it was like, it was really nice. However, it was very, like, I wouldn't have been able to move abroad, do any of the stuff that I've done mm -hmm. since then. So meeting Matthew, yes, resulted in having two children. It's resulting in me living in London. It's resulted in me in having an amazing tennis career that I had, mm -hmm. ultimately writing a book. Mm -hmm. So with him, whilst we weren't a good match, actually, as a couple, we still get on well mm -hmm. because obviously we share kids and whatnot. Um, but I think that meeting him just set me off and I've done things that I've kind of really enjoyed and have made my life really full. Yeah, I think that like came across and I think what was interesting is like reading through the different relationships you've had, like each one gave you something in a different way. Yeah, correct. Right? And I think I really value that, that you got that across. It wasn't just about the attachment to the person or the mm -hmm. love for the person you were able to see sort of a wider perspective that like maybe didn't work out with this person, but that doesn't mean it was a failure because look at all the other stuff yeah. that it brought into my life. Yeah, I love the topic of failure mm -hmm. and, I, and I think there's no such thing as failure in yep. life. It's only a failure if you let it be a failure and you don't go and try again or try mm -hmm. something different. So um, for me, I, I literally don't have, maybe that's why, because I don't have a concept of mm -hmm. failure. And actually it's so interesting and I don't know if I wrote about this in the book, but it was, so I was best friends with my neighbor in Slovenia for, since childhood. And the day that I moved out of my house, cause I was the one to leave the relationship. And I thought, okay, you know, if I want to leave, I can't kick him out. So mm -hmm. I actually left the house to my ex at that point. And I went over to my friend's house cause she was like, oh, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, I've just moved out. I'm back in my own flat. She goes, okay, come over for some drinks. And I'm like, amazing. So I go over there. And I think the only thing that she's done more in life at that point, if we measure by ticking things off, is she was married. 
And I wasn't, but also because I never wanted to be married. But anyway, so she had that over me, right? And I had just broken up my relationship. And so she asked me outside having a cigarette, um, oh, when did you fail in life? And this was after having two children, after having a PhD, after having my own company, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. After actually having a really nice relationship and Matthew mm -hmm. is a really nice guy. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow. Like my best friend has just asked me, when have I failed in life? And I literally cut ties with her after that because I don't want to be around people who kick me when I'm down. Interesting. Yeah, and I think it's like, a, it's a different way of looking at like, failure like failure sometimes is just a natural ending to things yeah I right agree. and like yeah. unless something comes to an end there's not like space for something new to come through wouldn't you say it's a bigger failure to stay in a relationship that's not making you happy on any level not I just making you happy that's but it's the not thing serving i think you anything. what you were what's like clear in the book what you've measured the success of your relationships mm. with hasn't been longevity Yeah. As, as sort of society. <laughs> Although I do like you. longevity. I have to say, I like longevity, yeah, but that's but you've not been, the key. Yeah. You've been focused on the quality of the yeah, experience correct. while you're in it, right? And I think that that's, that's where it gets tricky for a lot of people because society says when it comes to relationships, it doesn't matter about the quality. No one yeah, ever asks right. that couple that's been together for 60 years, were they actually happy for point. that? You know, that length of period. No, it's just, oh, look at that couple. They've been together for yeah. so long, right? And so I think that that's where it was like really useful the way you had written it because you can see in each situation what you had gotten out of it mm. and that, that value for both of you yeah. may have come to an end and that's why it was time to move on. And I think that's really important to keep in mind, especially when you're dating or haven't found the one yet yeah. because you can look at your past and go, oh, look at how many didn't work out versus look how each relationship has shaped me, has changed me, have given me insight, has mm. given me new opportunities. And I think that was like valuable yeah. in a way that... And I have I to really say, I have a, a lot of affinity for, to men or for men. Yeah. And they've taught me a lot about myself and about life in general. So I think I owe it to them to be the person who I am today because <laughs> they yeah. did they loved me unconditionally they were they, they were amazing they were my best they were my cheerleaders the whole time so if I don't have that I'm out of the relationship immediately because that's how you should be with someone you should be cheering them on to be the best version of themselves mm -hmm. they can be so if you're feeling threatened or this and that it's just on you like mm -hmm. you should be your 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 mate's best friend and cheerleader I think and uh all these long-term relationships that I've had they've been like that for me so um yeah I'm grateful to them they've been amazing Yeah, you mentioned that in the book, that that was like one of the significant things for you is in these relationships that have been a stabilizing yeah, and healthy correct. force for you, yeah, they have. right? In the way that maybe, and we'll get to this at some point, but parents weren't. Correct. So <laughs> it sounds like you found that pillar yeah. of strength and stability in your partners. Yeah, that's true, which yeah. I think has been great. Yeah, yeah, it's important to have that kind of a viewpoint, I think, is that like we're not just together for the sake of, together yeah. but we have to add to each other's life in some kind of valuable way significant way i think we do and i think and i don't know if this is true but because my, so i had my first boyfriend throughout my whole high school so we met mm -hmm. in when i was in year one he was in year four so in slovenia the high school was four years and so we were together for all that time and i think that he was like the perfect boyfriend for any girl that mm -hmm. could ever have he was amazing and i think And I wonder, maybe as a psychologist, that your first relationship maybe mm. kind of sets, you know, yeah. um, what do you call it, like the pace for whatever else you're going to have. Mm -hmm. So because I had an amazing first relationship, I'm like, yeah, all my boyfriends should be like this. And that's how it was. Versus maybe mm -hmm. if you don't have a good relationship to start with, maybe that's what you see. I don't know. But yeah. I was lucky enough to go through like a really beautiful relationship in my formative, I guess, teen years. So. But that's exactly what it is. It's formative. Yeah, yeah. So when you have a healthy relationship early on, I think it's really, really significant because yeah. you're less likely to tolerate. Right? Yeah, going, that's it. Because it yeah. feels like yeah, you're going it. back and you're like, no, 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 no. It's <laughs> We're going forward like, yeah. in life, not yeah. back. Yeah. Or at least the same with a little bit yeah. extra. <laughs> and, it, and it would have a, a stronger impact because you're so impressionable at that age yeah. when you're younger. So whatever experience you've had with, with a partner informs your sense of self-worth as well. Yeah. Yeah. Right. As an adult, if you figure it out who you are and mm. you have all the stuff around you and you like, you know, are confident and capable and then you have a bad relationship, you're like, oh, this is bad. Yeah. Right. And you're more 
boundaried about it yeah, affecting that's you. It. But yeah. when you're 15, 16, 17, you're like, I don't know who I am. And this person te- teaches you like crap, yeah. then it sets in. So yeah, I think that was like, that was really important that yeah. you had that really healthy experience. How you manage to be <laughs> a healthy guy, I don't know. <laughs> but because a lot of times we struggle at such an early age to choose the right kind yeah. of partner. So oh, that yeah. I'm like, that's a that's another conversation. Yeah. And he had a great so family. We're still friends. If I run into them, they're still so happy to wow. see me. And Amazing. I see him once in a while. He has his own family now. But I've stayed friends with all these guys. So it's been nice. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And with your ex, Matthew, who mm-hmm. you co-parent with. Yes. I mean, that's yeah. Yeah. like the co-parenting relationship is clearly solid. Yeah, correct. Yeah. And I think that's the only thing that we have in common, to be honest. It's quite bizarre. Like, we're such different characters, which is okay, but different energy levels. Mm -hmm. I don't know. He works throughout the night. I like to go to sleep (laughs) at normal hours. So we're just all over the place character-wise. But regarding parenting, we were on point since day one, um, which is actually amazing. So very few times were there when we thought differently, but then we had a chat. Mm -hmm. And then we agreed on either his or my point of view, depending on what it was, or the child. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, because they were always allowed to kind of have their point of view and if they argued something well we would mm-hmm. say yes to them because you know they put some thought into it and they want it so why would I say no um, so regarding parenting we were really on point and I think this is and I really feel for parents that are not on the same page with each other parenting wise I can't imagine anything harder than that to be honest why is that so I think if you I think so first of all okay I have two kids two boys mm-hmm. and I thought great they'd be both the same <laughs> amazing my life is easy Day one, I could see that, they're, that the second one is completely different to the first one, right? Okay. So imagine that you have two completely different children. So mm-hmm. I think how you should parent children, this is my opinion, is based on their character, mm-hmm. not based on yours, first and foremost. I can't be parenting a child who's completely different to me in a mm-hmm. way that I want to because I'm just going to cause him so much stress and drama mm-hmm. that he's never going to get out mm-hmm. of that. So I thought, you know, it's not... Let me just let him be and just guide him a little bit more. <laughs> Um, But let's say that you have two different kids and then you have a parent who disagrees with your values and what you think is right and wrong. Like, I don't know, let's say just a banal thing. Let's say I think that the kids should be home at 9 p.m. But my partner thinks, no, they're fine to come home at 1 a.m. How Mm -hmm. are we going to come to that agreement? Right, right. Like, I can't even imagine. Or, I don't know, let's say that I really feel strongly, which I do, that we should eat as a family. Mm Mm-hmm. And my partner thinks, whatever, let, let's just eat, you know, mm-hmm. behind the kitchen table whenever mm-hmm. anyone is hungry and they want to do that. Mm-hmm. Like, how are we going to come it. together on that, right? Whereas right. my said, okay, listen, I think, you know, and I've read a lot about that, families that eat together, stay together. Stay. <laughs> <Yes. Yep>. Sometimes. <laughs> but I think it just creates a value within children to see that the family is a unit and maybe that's why everyone still gets on with everyone. It's a time where you actually you see each other, you share stories, you see the kids together. Um, you know, and if someone doesn't believe in that, how are you going to convince him or her that that's mm-hmm. not a value? Or, I don't know, um, that it's important to read right. books to a child, for example. Yeah. You know, maybe yeah. someone doesn't like books and they think whatever, but yeah. I think maybe, yes, you should read to a child a lot. Yeah. So it's just these basics that I think right. it's so much easier if you agree on. I don't know. I don't know how people do it when they don't agree. I have to say. Yeah, that. because what you're saying is like, not only is it problematic for the two individuals involved, because it's like friction yeah. and who's gonna have the upper hand and like all of that but also like children are impressionable and they're trying exactly, to yeah. absorb the values of the family yeah. right like whatever family they grow up with they easily absorb those values and so if there's a different value system it confuses them right? yeah the, the world true. is already yeah. big and confusing yeah, they yeah, don't need yeah. to be confused yeah. at home as it's well true. So, yeah, and then they have to take sides. Who are we going to abide oh, by? And who, yeah, that's So true. it can get very, very messy, yeah. And also, it's interesting. So they have... <laughs> this is something that they come to me and tell me because they, re- they realize they're a bit different to their friends, for example. So they were never fussy. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, maybe they didn't like one or two things. But actually, they were never fussy. But we never made a fuss either. This is the food that we're eating. We never asked them, oh, do you like this? Do you want this? It's like, this is the food we all ate. And, yeah, I've never had an issue with them eating anything. So, I don't know, I just think it made a lot of things really easy. Or maybe that's just how they are. Because with the first one, when I had Nick, I thought, I'm such a good parent. <laughs> you just have it's to set so boundaries. <laughs> you just have to read some books. Gina Ford is amazing for all of those who are struggling with little children. Gina Ford is so good. I've read all her books. But saying that, the first one conformed to Gina Ford, the second one didn't at all. So I'm like, okay, I have to figure that one out on myself. 
But yeah, the first one I thought, oh, this parenting is easy. Then I get the second one, I'm like, <laughs> it's not about me. It's actually about the child. <laughs> I'll so, own it for the first one, but for the second God. one, it's about the kid. No, definitely. So I was just lucky with the first one being kind of similar to me as well, maybe. So it was just very mm -hmm. natural and very easy. Uh, whereas the second one's maybe more similar to his dad, character-wise. Um, and I just had to do things that I would never do otherwise for any man apart from this child. Like, for example, I'm very outgoing. I like to be outside. And I mm -hmm. think children should be outside. Mm -hmm. My son had different <laughs> had a different agenda. I would put him in a pram. Even when he was mm -hmm. tiny, we would go out for a walk. He would cry from the minute we left the house. And to this day, wow. he prefers to be at home. Whereas I don't, for example. But And that really broke my character, I think, kind of one year into having the second child. Because mm -hmm. I had two kids now. I couldn't do what I wanted to mm -hmm. it on any level. Um, and I have a child who is stressed whenever we go anywhere, mm -hmm. like literally stressed. And so that made me stay home more. And that really kind of, I don't know, I don't know if the word is broke, but yeah, it broke me in basically because it, it, it was a change in my character mm -hmm. because I had to do what the child wanted me to do. I had no other option. Apart from causing right. him stress maybe, which I wasn't going to do. So That's what I was going to ask. So when you have a child that's yeah. like different than you are, mm -hmm and is resisting, is pushing back, and you're like, I as the parent know what is healthy for you and mm. good for you. You should go outside, you should... Mm. At what point do you start to go, maybe my perceptions or thoughts or wants are mm. not what this child is wanting? Yeah. And that even though... Because, you know, there's like a fine line, how much of the child do there you respond to? There is a point, correct, yeah, I was going to say that. Versus, yeah, there's, a, there's an expectation, yeah. and they should fit into that, but also we need to take their feeling is yeah. into account. So how do you like maneuver that fine line? Yeah, that's a very good question. It is a fine line, definitely. So on one hand, you have to know the child, right? Mm -hmm. You have to know who you're dealing with. And so for example, okay, fine, he wouldn't want to go for a walk. So luckily we had a garden, so I'd put a blanket out and put him outside mm -hmm. and he was quite happy meandering around there. So that was that solution. However, there was another issue, he wouldn't go anywhere. So mm -hmm. obviously you have to go places sometimes, yes. right? So when he was still little, I would just like put him in his, in his baby seat, chuck the shoes in the car, and off we We're go. Okay. Because when he was there, he was always happy to be there. It was right. just the stress of leaving the house. I don't know what he was in his previous life. <laughs> An abandoned dog, I had a feeling always. <laughs> like, seriously. He would bring me things in his mouth when he was tiny on all fours. Oh, and I'm like, <laughs> and then when we did buy a dog, actually, he calmed down immediately. Like, it was a change of character. It was so, so different. But anyway. And so when, as he got older, and you were able to discuss with him a little bit more, if I told him that we were leaving the house in like two mm -hmm. days we were going somewhere, then he was able to prepare himself mentally and then right. there wasn't that much of a struggle. But if there was, for example, and things had to be done, I would literally strap him in his uh, mm -hmm. car seat, chuck the because there was no time for anything. Like yeah. in shoes, we'll put your shoes on later, let's go. Mm -hmm. So whereas oftentimes Matthew, for example, but this was only visible more when we split up, he would not be bothered with that and let him stay home mm -hmm. and he would do whatever he needed to do. So which I wouldn't allow him to do it because I know it's just a character thing and I know that he enjoyed whatever we were doing later on. Mm -hmm. Saying that, that largely stopped following one event. He was probably about seven or eight and we were in Slovenia and I said to him, oh, me and, so his older brother's best friend, mother, we decided we're gonna go on this trip. And he's like, oh, I'm sure it's gonna be so boring. I'm like, do you think me and her sat down and thought, we had three boys between us. Do you think we sat down and thought, where's the most boring thing to do with these kids, right? <laughs> And then he realized that wasn't the case. And, and then he actually stopped with his, that kind of, that event kind of stopped him being so resistant to everything because obviously, and obviously the trip was amazing. So he realized, oh yeah, maybe I am being difficult. And recently he actually did admit that sometimes he was difficult just for the sake of being difficult. So he had a perspective shift. He did. And I'm like, you know what? Yeah. A, it's amazing that you figured that out. And B, yeah. thank you for telling me that. Yeah. And, but I think you were in tune to like, trying to create a situation where it wasn't a resistance yeah right like you will do what i tell you yeah, to do no, no, um because no. that that leads to having to break the child spirit in order so i didn't want to do that yeah. because i know that that will serve him well in real life yes so i thought yes. let me leave him it's more difficult for me because obviously yes. i'm with him 24 7 more or less but in life this trait is going to serve him well so yes. let me leave that let I me think not that break is, him let so me break myself instead. <laughs> well, because we as parents grow, yeah. right? Because you have to develop different skills and yeah. you have to be more compassionate and patient and all of that stuff. So you grow as well. 
and he gets to hold on to a part of his yeah. character, which is important, which is like he's going to resist things that don't work well for him. But now and... I'm too patient in life. I'm, just, I'm like, <laughs> I shouldn't be this patient. But he broke me and I am. <laughs> I think that's a really important point because I think a lot of parents want the easy child. Yeah, right. Oh, but for sure. Yeah, the easy, but... easy child is easy for you, and at some point yeah. as they grow up, they might be more willing to conform to other people's standards as well. So what people forget is like the difficult child is also going to be resistant to Correct. peer pressure and all of that. You just have to work a different way, and maybe a little bit harder. It is harder, definitely. But interestingly, like you say that. With the older one, I have to teach him how to say no because he's a people pleaser by character. Right. There we go. And yeah. I said to him, you, if you don't want to do something, because he would come to me and say, okay, this and this person wanted this. And I said, no, no, no. But then mm. I was kind of pushed to say yes. And I said, you have to, if you, if it's no, you have to, you have to stick to your no. Mm -hmm. So the other one, I'm like, you have to say yes sometimes in life because <laughs> it's going to make your life so much more interesting. You can't just keep on saying no. So it's interesting that they're on yeah. both ends of the spectrum. It's like, how did that happen? But that, that's how they are. So interesting. I think another important point, and you make this point several times as you're talking about your kids, is that we don't own children, Correct. right? Yeah. Like they're here and we guide them. I think there was uh, something you mentioned about Steven, the psychologist Steven Pinker, mm -hmm. where he said, it's either you're a shepherd or an engineer, I love right? That, so yeah. you can either get there and like mold your child into who you want them mm -hmm. to be, or you guide them like a shepherd through yeah. life. You should be a shepherd, actually. You shouldn't be an yes. engineer, yeah. Because he yeah. says very, very nicely, you can't turn a sheep into a dog. Mm. Like you might break the sheep a little bit, but yeah, yeah. So I fully believe that we don't own our children. Mm -hmm. So you have to be a bit detached to them, not obviously emotionally detached and whatnot, but they're their own human mm -hmm. beings. Ultimately, you have the pleasure of having them. Yeah. Not all days are pleasurable, but <laughs> you do. You have once yeah. they're out of the house, you, you have the yeah. pleasure of having them. Um, and I think that if you are the shepherd based on their own character, mm -hmm. they can really grow into themselves. And it's just so amazing watching them, yeah. how they grow and what they're doing yeah. um, versus kind of having broken children yeah. who are then, I don't know, maybe even dependent on you the whole life or what, I don't know yeah. what people are trying to do with that, but I think, yeah, let them flourish and let them be yeah. who they are. And I think the most you can give them is that, A, that they can develop their own character. And B, I've always told them, if you need, like, whenever you're stuck in life, you can come back to me, always. Like, mm -hmm. I'm here for your, you know, for your safety. And that means you can't really fall in life because mm -hmm. you can't fall because you have someone there catching mm -hmm. you. But as long as it's all good, go and do whatever you need to do. So I'm just there to, like, catch them if they fall. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it actually takes the pressure a little it, bit off yeah, as a parent, right? Yeah. Because it's like you understand that this child has their own journey to mm. go on. And you kind of have to teach them about life so they can maneuver oh, the yeah. world. Um, but that they're going to need to find their own way. And I think that, you know, when you get in there and you sort of try to engineer your child, you might even engineer what appears like a successful child. Yeah, right? They true. go to university. They have a great degree. They have a great job. But uh, what I often see is that if someone's not in tune with their own needs then they're unhappy yeah on some true. level so you want to raise successful and happy children yeah, yeah even happiness i find is a character trait because oftentimes with the second one i'm like he remembers every negative thing that's ever been done to him mm. and i said to him even from the from when he was three i'm like if you're going to remember every negative thing that someone's done to you you're going to have a very unhappy life i was like mm. i'm completely brutal with them like, forget about it. And he doesn't because he had this kindergarten teacher that he still can't get over. <laughs> I'm oh, like, wow. come on. So, but then he had another one who everyone hated because she was so strict. And mm -hmm. he just loved her because he just likes to be, he likes guidance and he likes mm -hmm. kind of rules more and stuff like that. Whereas the other one was making him do things. Like, for example, I don't know, it was hot outside. They went for a walk. He wanted to keep his jacket on, mm -hmm. right? Because it doesn't like change. So he, he gave me the jacket. He wants to have his jacket on. And so I had a meeting with her and she's like, oh, but he's going to get sick if he's sweaty and whatever. I'm like, get, let him get sick. If that's the way that he's going to learn, yeah. let him get sick. I'm not bothered, yes. but stop stressing the child who now doesn't want to go to kindergarten because of you. Right. So yeah. he's always loved going there and now he doesn't want to go. So you need to stop. So I was, yeah. and I was also told them in school, I'm always going to be on your side, whatever mm -hmm. happens. So all you need to do is tell me what actually happened mm -hmm. and I'll always be on your side. And they felt a relief actually, I have to say, because oftentimes kids feel that they're not believed just because they're children. Totally. Yeah. And I said to them, what are, your only responsibility is to tell me the truth. Mm -hmm. That's it. And then I will always be on your side. No matter, like, even if you mess something up, it's fine. It's life. Like, mm -hmm. even if they were sometimes naughty in school, they would go, oh, you know what I did today? <laughs> I'm like, that's fine. I was also naughty in school, but they don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's 
that's not relevant. <laughs> <laughs> they don't need to know that. <laughs> that's why I'm like, yeah, whatever. You're a child. Just do stuff sometimes, right? But like, you have to take the consequences also, which I was also yeah. able to take. So if I yeah. if I did something, I'm like, that's fine. I will I'll deal yeah. with the consequences, but I would rather do it than not do it. I'm not afraid of consequences because you know, if you do something, this is gonna follow. Right. And I'm like, okay, fine. Let it follow. Because the choice is yours. Yeah, it's yeah. my choice. I want to do this. And if that's yes. the consequence, okay, fine, whatever. Then I'm willing to take yeah. it on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's it. So you mentioned a little bit about your you being a child and you being a bit naughty as well. Mm -hmm. I wanted to touch on your upbringing because it sounds like you're a very different parent than your yes, parents I were. Thank God. Right? So, <laughs> yeah. And But it's interesting because like in psychology, sometimes we say you just sort of like repeat what you see. Yeah. But you seem to have not done that so what no. was your upbringing like a little bit and how did you then as a parent decide very distinctly mm. i have these expectations and standards for myself as a parent and i'm going to do differently yeah so just before we touch on to my parents it was just interesting that i, I never had any affinity to children before mm -hmm. like i wasn't when i saw a small child it was like okay it's a small child that's it but i kind of thought that when i have my own children i'm going to be a good parent i kind mm -hmm. of always kind of had that expectation of myself Okay, being a good parent is a lot different things for different people, right? So my upbringing, um, I guess, uh, what can I say to that? I guess everyone tries their best. My, my parents had me, maybe at the time it wasn't that young, but like nowadays I think it's very young. So my mother was 22, just 22. And my dad was, I don't know, 24, 25, whatever. So for me, if I had a child at that age, I don't think I would be a good parent. Definitely mm -hmm. not to the to the extent mm -hmm. that I think I parent them literally as best that they kind of could be parented now. Um, I think when you're younger, maybe some people are just, I'm just like, I think it took me a long time to grow up. I'm probably still mm -hmm. not grown up fully, but, <laughs> but I take, I took a very long time to mature, let's say. And I think some people maybe mature sooner. I don't know. So mm -hmm. if you do mature at 22, kudos to you. For me, I was a child. So if I had children at that time, I think I would have been a very poor parent. I would have, it probably would have ruined my life and it would have been horrific for me. Um, and so I think from that standpoint, at 22, how formed are you as a human being? Not very. Not very. So how are you going to parent a, a child now? And also for me, like, I'm also quite independent, um, active. I want things my own way, even when I was little. So my mother's quite more, let's say passive so she couldn't handle that i'm more like kind of character wise i'm more like my dad but he also felt like he's in competition with us the, his whole life which is also quite yeah. bizarre like why yeah. would you be in competition but i think all of these things stem because you haven't lived the life that you you have or there's something wrong with your ego mm -hmm. or something that you haven't done in life if you're trying to pass that on to your children mm -hmm. and so i grew up so i was mostly friends with my dad let's say i would hang out with my dad more because he was active and he would just take me along wherever so i had very little contact maybe with my mother in general until they divorced when i was 15 16. and then i'm like oh <laughs> now i get to live with my mother uh which i hadn't really before just mm. maybe because she had two other smaller uh, younger siblings yeah. so she was dealing with that uh, and i was just like kind of hanging out with my dad so which was fine and then when they split up i just thought okay because he didn't even tell us he just left the house he didn't say okay or the parents didn't say okay we're getting a divorce this and this he just left so I'm like, okay, fine. And I do this to this day now. It's like, okay, you want to leave? There's the door. Bye bye. Like, I, right. you know, well, if you hadn't point. even discussed it with me, then if you want to leave, bye bye. So, right. um, and also, you know what, if you're competing with me, if you're not supportive of me, which he, he wasn't, if, if you're not cheering me on for anything I've done in life, I don't need, like, it's just, it just brings me down. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be around people who are like your parents at the right. end of the day and they're bringing you down. Like, why yeah. would you do that? So it's just not a healthy kind of environment for me to be in too much. Obviously, my mother is a different story. You want to be in good relationships with your mother. But again, and it's a pity that we're not actually, because I think it's such an important relationship in life. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I think she just has, for me, like the poor me syndrome, and I just can't deal with that. You're very different from that. I know, and I can't so. stand that. And I just, yeah. and because she tries to suck me in that way, and I'm completely resistant to that. Mm -hmm. So there's just a, there's always been a tension there because of that. So mm. that's how it is. Um, and then when I had my own kids, I think I was just like in a good headspace. I was mature enough. I was finishing my PhD and I thought, okay, this has been boring now. I've like partied all I could possibly party. I've studied all I could possibly study. 
you know, I've had a really good life. And I thought, oh, maybe it's time for a child. Right. <laughs> and there he goes. <laughs> and then he came. So that's literally how it happened. I was completely ready for it. Um, so he was a bit of a surprise, let's say. But I'm like, yeah, cool. Let me just do that now. So it was really good. And it sounds like good that the first one was the more easy. And literally, it was like easy going. I was like, yeah, this is fantastic. It's so sweet, nice. He eats everything he does. He sleeps. So also, I was still writing up my PhD as I had him actually. So it was my fifth year because it, it lasted five years back in the day. So while he slept, because he was like on a really good regimen, I would like write my PhD in between. Then he woke up, played with him. He went to sleep. I wrote my PhD with the second one. I wouldn't be able to write a single word. So, right. and he was actually at my Viva when he was three months old. So that was so sweet. So my mother and a friend of mine had him uh, while I was like there pitching my Viva. And then when I get, um, got my plaque or whatever you get, um, there was a guy who came to me and goes, oh, he's going to be here in 30 years. And I'm like, oh, oh that's so that's sweet. sweet. <laughs> that's really sweet. One of the so, last yeah. things I want to ask that the viewers might have a question about is like, when you have an upbringing that's less than ideal. Yeah. And now you want to become a parent. Yeah. How do you try to do what, oh, you, okay, what wasn't yeah, done see. for you? I have to say, like, in general, like, my parents would say fine. That, like, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. There was nothing. We were always kind of well off. So there was never anything like that. But emotionally, they were completely distant, let's say. Um, and I think maybe because of my boyfriends, I guess, I was probably quite closed off, to be honest. And yeah. So they kind of cracked me open emotionally i would say um and then like okay i'll give you an example which is actually so interesting and i knew this would happen as well so i still to this day cuddle my children now they don't want it that much <laughs> but i think i still enjoy it secretly <laughs> but of course if you have like a tiny baby of course you're going to cuddle the child so even when yeah. they were three four five six you know they would come and sit in my lap and watch mm. something on tv or whatever and so one day, and I was I was literally waiting for this moment. My mother appears because we were at her house at that time, and she's like, "Oh, we didn't cuddle you as children because we weren't cuddled." Right. I'm like, "How sad is that? Like right. that you're just repeating things that are just so pointless." Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I don't know how you. I think you just have to make a decision. I don't know. Is that a decision or is it just how you kind of are? But I think if you've had something done to you that's not good, why would you want to repeat that right. to your child? I think it has, if it doesn't come naturally, you have to do it consciously. Yeah. Because if I wasn't cuddled as a child, what, am I not going to cuddle my own baby now? Right. Okay. Like, so but that's, I don't know, but I felt that. I felt that I wanted to cuddle them and they were so cute yeah. and cuddly and whatever, but all babies are. Almost, some actually don't want to be cuddled, but I don't know. I think, I don't know how you get out of that, actually. What if you don't feel like you want to cuddle your child? Well, I think you... You, you said it perfectly. If something's not coming to you naturally, you have to do it consciously. Yeah. Right? And so then, like, if you're raised a certain way and it's molded you a certain yeah. way, I think that when you do have children, you have to focus on what a child needs and yeah. to, like, meet them at that level yeah. as well to try to undo maybe some of the history. If you come from a family, a legacy of yeah. individuals who've been emotionally restrictive or yeah. withholding... And you've seen the impact of that, and maybe your instinct isn't to be so touchy feely, yeah. but you know children need that. Yeah. Then it's uh, you have to, and you know maybe because you and your mother were nearly ten years apart yeah. in terms of when you had kids, she was twenty two. Yes, yeah, so I was thirty when yes. I had my child, which I yeah. think is a good age. I have yeah. to say. Yeah, and you were like quite educated at yeah. that point, and had seen it a lot, and had had healthy. Yeah. partners so yeah, it I think seems that helps, like to be honest yeah but I read a lot of books as well and I think also naturally like I'm a natural parent mm -hmm. which is quite bizarre because if you knew me back in the day no one would have thought that but I actually always felt like yeah I think I'm like a natural nurturer maybe so <laughs> it did kind of come naturally but I did I'd read a lot of books I read a lot about children mm -hmm. I read a lot about the stages of pregnancy what mm -hmm. happens after so um I like psychology so I would read psychology books about that as well and i think actually gina ford for like basic baby things is so so good like they were both potty trained by gina ford worked perfectly right. they were the first thing they can do to be potty trained I'm like, yes <laughs> not competitive <laughs> but it doesn't yeah. do them any good to be like in nappies for mm -hmm. two three like three four years whatever mm -hmm. it's not a good thing so 
Um, sleeping wise, the first child was perfectly put to sleep by Gina Ford. Mm-hmm. The second one wasn't. That had to be a different story. But it's good to have books that you at least have some ideas what to do. Yeah. Because if you have no idea what to do in a certain That's situation, right. I think that can cause quite a lot of anxiety. So I did read a lot about babies and, and stuff yeah. like that as well before. So recognize what you don't know yeah. and oh. reach out for How help. would you know what to do with a baby? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> and even when you have the second one, it's different. Yeah. Like, how would you know what to yeah. do with that? So yeah, I think reading at least, but now you have the internet, for example, which wasn't even yeah. that big in back you in the day. You have to read about the babies. Like, yeah. yeah, it's so nice to know stuff, I think, when you go yeah. into something brand new, like a project, like a child for the yeah. rest of your life. So I think read, read, read. <laughs> if you don't have that naturally yeah. or if you weren't brought up like in a caring environment, let's say. I think that's a good sort of point to to end on is that like read right yeah read your book as well because yeah. you have like I said at ever at the end of every chapter you have information and questions there for yeah. the reader to be able to reflect on their own life you sometimes you need someone to instate thought yeah. processes that you wouldn't otherwise have and you also mentioned you didn't think you would be instinctively a good mother no one would mm. have thought that but you did and then you found that aspect of you that was yeah. there. And I think that shows throughout your life, which is you've thrown yourself into different <laughs> situations with countries and careers mm. and partners and kids. And I think that you've had that instinct is to like, I'm just going to throw myself into it yeah. and something will come. And it did. Yeah. You found an aspect of you that's been able to, to manage it and whatever you haven't you know, known naturally, you've sought out books and stuff. So I think that's just the healthy way to be. In oh, life. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Here's to you. <laughs> Perfect note to end up. All right. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs>